Good morning, everyone. It is May 10th. 10th. Okay, good, good. May 10th. Uh, I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the E12 Education Finance Conference Committee to order, please. Uh, welcome. Uh, we are today are going to be going through uh, a series of presentations on provisions that are in the House bill but were uh, either not heard or not included in the Senate. Uh, we've got a, a rundown here that I have. A uh, few people I know are coming, uh, but are not, we're not able to be here because of previous commitments uh, right here at the beginning, but that's fine. We will uh, have given everyone 10 minutes, and uh, there's a, some likelihood of song um, if, you know, kind of trying to keep up with the Senate yesterday with the... Uh, uh, McPhail, yeah. thank you, Senator. Uh, I, I, it's, it suddenly slipped my mind, the McPhail uh, presentation. I'm not, not quite sure. This would be more of a sing-along thing, so I'm not quite sure whether we'd get to the same level uh, as, as McPhail did. But um, I'd like to start. <clears throat> uh, if we may, with a uh, presentation from Ignite. Terry Dennison Kinneen. Uh, and, and Madam Chair, Ignite is an example. Uh, I think you'll see repeatedly through these series of presentations where the House in our finance decisions, uh, both the more organizational ones to the school districts as well as to, to partner organizations such as Ignite, emphasize uh, statewide. Funding emphasize uh, places where it's public dollars that are going to make the difference. And uh, Ignite is, as you know, the statewide, the statewide uh, after school, uh, out of school time uh, organization and uh, could play a key role uh, getting us out of some decision making that we probably shouldn't be making, uh, but uh, doing so in a, in a more uh, structured and rigorous way. Uh, Mr. Chair? Ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have uh, toured uh, the uh, Ignite, uh, one of the Ignite uh, settings in uh, one of my schools, so oh. uh, familiar with uh, what they do there, and um, we'll look forward to the presentation today. And uh, just uh, so I'll we'll look forward to hearing more about it. Very good. Ms. Dennison Kinneen, welcome to the committee again. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, members of the conference committee. Again, my name is Carrie Dennison Kinneen, and I'm the executive director of Ignite After School. We are Minnesota's statewide after school network, and I'm here to share a little bit of information with you about the After School Community Learning Grants Bill, which was included in the House Education Omnibus at $2 million per year over the biennium and $2.5 million in the tails. Uh, we are super excited about that inclusion and want to share a little bit about how it helps meet the state's uh, education goals. So I want to start by just sharing a little bit about the state's history and funding after school programs. Uh, so the state invested up to $11 million back in about 2001 and then in uh, 07, 08 invested about $5.3 million in the after school community learning grant bill. Uh, and then there has not been another appropriation since that time. So there is a history of this funding. Uh, I also just want to note that there's federal funding that does come to Minnesota called the 21st Century Community Learning Center funds. Uh, and the funding there for after school, there's a huge demand for it. So while there were 55 programs that applied for that funding, only 14 programs were funded. So that left about a 12.1 million funding gap there. Uh, and what's really exciting about after school is an opportunity uh, to really look at disparities, equity, uh, young, young people's performance in school is when you look at the cohort of 21st century grantees across the state and you look at those who regularly participate versus those who don't regularly participate, they're just much more likely to be proficient in both, um, um, both reading and math testing. So I like to share the, the most impressive number. So for English language students, uh, they are 125% more likely than English language students who are not uh, regularly participating to be proficient in math on the MCAs. So that's just a really exciting 
Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Senator Nelson. Yes, if you could uh, explain that uh, statistic again and, and where it came from, please. Yes, so the Ms. Minnesota Nelson, Department please. of Education did some analysis of the participants who participate, because since they manage the 21st century federal funds, and all of those sites report to them and they're able to look at all of the students. They looked at, okay, now this is only students who attended 21st century who are English language learners and also those receiving free and reduced price lunch. One more Senator question, Nelson. just to, because this is important information. I'm so glad you're bringing us yeah. data. Yeah. Uh, but I want to know, uh, of the federal grant, the 21st century uh, learning a federal grant, uh, is only Ignite the only uh, after school provider that has been uh, a portion uh, apportioned uh, is in fact so what I want to know is if the data that you're giving us is only of those after school programs that are ignite after school programs and their data or if this is a little bit broader and that there are other after school programs in addition to ignite which also um, are funded through the 21st century learning Ms. Ms. Dennison Kanina, I, I think uh, a, a dimension off of the center's question, yes. and correct me if I'm wrong, is is Ignite a provider of after school programs? And can you cl help clarify for the committee that? Please? Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, yes, I can. Ignite After School does not directly provide any after school programs. So when we talk about it, none of these programs that I'm talking about is an Ignite After School program. Um, so as the statewide after school network, we provide professional development and do advocacy work and other supports for all after school programs across the state, but we do not directly provide programming. Senator Nelson. So, thank you. And thank you for laying this groundwork because it'll be so important as we listen, yeah. as uh, we listen to the rest of your testimony. So, um, so Ignite is considered the statewide after school programs because it's the clearinghouse for, so there's a number of statewide after school programs and so I'm just trying to one get my mind around Ignite's role in that and if there are other things that are outside of Ignite yeah. and then also of the data that you're going to give us and if the data is specific to the Ignite um, the after school programs that have run through the Ignite uh, clearinghouse so to speak so that, that's kind of where I'm trying to get the information. Ms. Dennison, can you? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, it is a little bit difficult. So I would think of Ignite After School as an intermediary or more like an association. Mm -hmm. We're not an association, but you could think about it more in that way where um, we have a lot of partners or organizations that are part of our network. Um, we serve all after school programs. So that could be school aged care, it could be a community ed uh, run after school program, it could be Boys and Girls Club, could be a YMCA. So many of those uh, statewide entities are a part of our network. So the Minnesota Community uh, Education Association, the State Alliance of Boys and Girls Club, the State uh, Network of YMCAs, uh, the Library uh, Association. So all of those folks are part of our network and they can then access the work that we do. And we do a lot of convenings around the state, bringing all of those partners together. Uh, and so when we do professional development, it's open to any after school program that wants to come and participate. So we're not exclusionary. You don't have to pay dues or anything like that. So we do both professional development and then we try to gather information around how our after school program is doing in the state from multiple sources and be able to share that information with you. Um, so we get that data and information in multiple ways. And I'm going to share a couple different sources of data in today's presentation. Thank, thank you. Yeah, so when I'm talking about the MCA scores, this is data that we have received from the Minnesota Department of Education, and they have their own materials on the results of their study. So they, so it's individual school districts, nonprofits, and others that apply for 21st century grants. And those individual school districts or um, you could be a YMCA or another nonprofit who receives that. So they're looking at all of those various organizations across the state who've received funding. They have to report into MDE and share information about the students they served. MDE looked at, state, uh, looked at students who came at least 30 sessions to a 21st century program that's considered regularly participating versus students who maybe came once or twice and then stopped going. So what they're finding is that regular participation in a 21st century program for free and reduced price lunch students and for limited English proficiency students, they're more likely to be proficient in both reading and math MCAs than those students who did not regularly attend. 
So that's what that data is showing. And then one further question. Senator Nelson. And so is that a similar students, uh, comparing similarly situated students, yes. uh, those who have participated regularly in the uh, after school program as to those who have not? Yeah, so they're looking Thank at you. English language learners, those who, who participated regularly compared to those who have not, and then free and reduced price lunch students, those who participated regularly and Thank those you. that Very do good. not. Very yes. Good. Yep. So, uh, so that's some of the data there. And also just again to stress that there were 55 applications and only 14 of those were funded. So there's many other communities around the state who are ready to go who want to be a part of this story and these outcomes, but there just was not the funding there at the time. Um, I also wanted to, sh this is another way that we use data at Ignite. We worked with Dr. Michael Rodriguez, um, who is in the uh, College of Education and Human Development at the University of Minnesota, to analyze Minnesota student survey data. So there are questions on the Minnesota student survey data that young people are self-reporting participation in after school. There, when we look statewide, we find, and when regular participation, I should just note, means three times per week. Um, we find that there's a huge equity gap in terms of who's participating regularly and not based on young people self reports. So statewide there's an 18% gap between higher income youth and lower income youth with only 51% of lower income youth participating regularly. And then in terms of white youth and youth of color, 67% of white youth participate regularly in after school while only 55% of students of color. So this is also a disparity around both income and uh, race that we are trying to address through state funding. So the after school community learning grant bill is designed to really ensure statewide distribution. How the department has done this in the past is they take the funding from the state and then they look at the population of students across the state and they kind of split up that money and reserve a certain amount of money for grants from different regions of the state. Over uh, time, this has ensured that small communities like Ely and McGregor have received grants as well as midsize, maybe what we would consider midsize like Duluth uh, have received funding as and Rochester, well Rochester is not midsize, it's a larger city. Um, they've also received funding and then suburban communities as well like Roseville. So there's really a good spread of types of communities that are supported with these grants across the state. Uh, the way the bill is designed, it also really values and promotes partnerships. And the reason that we do this is this is about making sure young people have access to all of the best kinds of learning opportunities that are available in their lo local community. So it encourages schools to partner with that YMCA or with the local arts organization to bring all those resources in and make them broadly available to kids who wouldn't otherwise have access. Uh, also, there's been some questions I've received around what's the uh, availability of these funds? Is it really accessible to culturally specific organizations uh, to really look at addressing disparities? And I just wanna note that the state over time has funded White Earth, the Fond du Lac tribes, Hmong American Partnership, the Minnesota Somali Parent Association, um, RIO in Rochester is a partner in the Rochester 21st Century Grant. So that's the Rochester um, youth organization that is a Somali organization and they operate at a local housing community uh, where that's where they do their programming and that's part of the grant that Rochester Community Ed receives. So there's really a broad number of types of programs that have access to this kinds of funding. Um, I also just wanted to point out that it aligns really well with the uh, governor and many of your visions around community schools. Um, after schools considered to be a best practice in community schools and I think that investments in community schools and after school programming can really be beneficial. So there are also 21st century grant recipients who are also full service community schools. Um, I also just wanted to note that 82% of parents, so this is a survey I want to say where my dad is coming from. The After School Alliance, which is a national organization, they surveyed parents in Minnesota and they did their surveying to make sure it could be you know, generalized to the population. That 82% of parents support public funding for after school programs and 77% of parents in Minnesota say that uh, when they know their child is safe in an after school program, it gives them peace of mind so they can focus on work. Which is, so this is both an opportunity to inspire learning, support kids, also to support working families, um, and to keep kids safe. 
uh, both safe and healthy. It makes sure kids are engaged in learning activities during times when they often can be the, the victim of a crime. And then also it provides an opportunity for uh, young people to have more access to food. So when we think about food insecurity, uh, the both 21st century and also state funded after school programs have really ensured that more young people have access to full dinner because that gets embedded to those after school program uh, after school programs. So for example, the way the federal food program works, you if you're getting <coughs> meals during the school day, if you're free and reduced price lunch, you can get breakfast and uh, lunch, but you can't get dinner through that same program. It would have to be a snack. There's something called the after school meals program where if you are providing an after school program and it's structured, you can get a full dinner option. So that really allows also for us to ensure that food is uh, something that all kids have access to. I'm watching time and I'm, we're over, so I'm gonna end there. <laughs> but I wanna thank you for your consideration of including this in the final uh, conference. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Dinison Kaneen. Um, and just to one, and I'll just, uh, so we, the data is very clear about uh, after-school programs, and we know how uh, helpful those can be. Um, I started an after-school program in Rochester, my uh, one of my first years at Willow <laughs> Creek, because we had kids that were in danger of failing the eighth-grade mm. reading test, and so uh, we had started an after-school program mm -hmm. and really uh, were able to help those kids uh, pass who had either were in danger of failing. So we know there's great rewards and there's great opportunities. And um, and so we have the, the federal grant. We also know that there are some state funds as well. And so I, I believe there's some state funds. It's just the federal grant for our after school programs. No state funds. I'm there's no misunder appropriation, Madam um, okay. Chair. Currently. So here's my question. So we have the federal grants. Uh, and I, I'm still trying to... So what does what role does Ignite play in so we have the federal grants, we have our individual school districts, our community ed that works with the school districts on these things. So just kind of share with me a little bit about maybe the history of Ignite, um, how long Ignite has been uh, and funded. I think you might have said 2007, 2011, but kind of talk to me a little bit about the history of, of, of the of Ignite. And then also, why would why would we as the state want to invest in Ignite when we have the funding coming from the feds? Mm -hmm. And what additional role does Ignite play in helping a school start an after school program? Ms. Dennison Kaneen. Yes, Madam Chair. I just want to note again that we are here representing the broad field of after school to support a competitive grants program. So all the funding that were that's in the bill would not come to Ignite. I just want to clarify that. We have been around for 16 years. Um, but I also, in full transparency, want to say that we do get receive some funding through 21st century. Um, we get uh, $75,000 a year from the Minnesota Department of Education as a professional development and technical assistance provider. And you'll also notice that in the after school community learning grant, bill design, and I think this is another really positive benefit of the way the bill is designed, is it supports continuous program improvement of programs. And not only of the funded programs, but anyone who, any program that could have applied for funding or would have been eligible to apply can participate in the professional development. So it kind of funds these programs and tries to lift all boats of any after school program that wants to participate in professional development. What we do at Ignite is we uh, manage something called, this is lots of words that might you know, be less exciting, but continuous program improvement, we lead something called making meaning with multiple data sets around the state where we train uh, facilitators in different communities and they lead uh, sessions. So 21st century grantees are required to attend, but it's also open to any after school program that wants to come. And what we do is we work with programs to look at four different types of data about their program and then help them make meaning and understand what that data is telling them and then help them create an improvement plan uh, to continue to improve and, and be really focused on what the best practices and effective practices are in after school. So that's really our role is to support quality improvement. Um, but again, we don't provide for any after school programs. And we would not have any um, decision making authority over who would receive the grants. That would be 
run by the Minnesota Department of Ed through a competitive grant process. And then one further question, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, yes Senator Nelson. Okay. No, go right yeah. ahead. Um, so with the, um, so I know the uh, after school programs are funded at the state level with $5 million. Uh, and I'm just curious, and then of course there's the federal funding as well. Does that $5 million of state funding, does that go directly to those programs or does it go to Ignite or how, are you aware of that funding and how is that? Uh, you told us about the $75,000 uh, from the feds. Uh, is, is Ignite also part of that $5 million of state funding that goes to after school programs? Ms. Dennison Kinney. Madam Chair, that $5 million that I referenced was back in the 07 08 biennium, so it, there isn't a current appropriation for the after school community learning grant bill. So I was talking about the history of funding that we have invested in after school in the past. We don't currently uh, have funding appropriated in the after school community learning grant right now. So we don't, so no program receives state funding right now and Ignite does not receive any. Um, the we, the um, Minnesota Department of Ed gave out about $7 million in federal funding in the last grant round. We received 75,000 of that, uh, well actually and more than 7 million, we received 75,000 for professional development and 7 million went out the door to programs through a competitive grant process. Thank you, and then my final question. Yes. I think um, Ms. Hofer can perhaps add some uh, clarity to w where I was trying to understand how, how, the, how, the, how, how all the funding works mm -hmm. and how do we get that out the door to those sites and exactly the role that Ignite kind of plays in all of that. Ms. Hofer. Ms. Hofer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members. Uh, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I think you were referring uh, to the community education revenue that has a component for uh, the youth after school enrichment program. Uh, so for those districts that opt to offer a youth after school enrichment program, uh, they would be able to levy an additional $1.85 uh, um, times the number of uh, people in the district. So that's on a population count for the district. And I believe, um, let me see here, just double checking this. Uh, a number of districts do offer that. I don't have the exact number, but that's something that we can look into. Thank you. Right. That is the five million. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Dennison Kinney. Oh, just really quick. Representative Pinto. This is just a quick question. I noticed Senator Eichhorn's name. Um, it looks like he may be the the Senate author was the Senate author of. No, oh, in fact, there he is. There he is. No, I was going to ask. I didn't want to eat at the table. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, so they made. I drew him up. The uh, topic the drew him to the, the table. Good, good point. Yes. Uh, uh, there's some joke there about the condition of our, of our building, but um, we'll go on from there. So, uh, well, then maybe it's Senator Ecker. I just had noticed his name on here and uh, was uh, pleased to see the bipartisan, um, uh, bicameral support. And uh, I was going to ask ask about that, but I guess he's here himself. And so, uh, presumably, um, anyway, it seems like a great, I know that it's a great program. And, and thank you so much uh, for bringing it forward and Senator Eichhorn for your work in the Senate on it. Senator Eichhorn, do you want to speak to the value of, of this program and, and, and this approach? I think the approach is good, but I, I like after school programs in general. We think we've seen some mm -hmm. good studies that, you know, those after school activities, whether it be through the work that Ignite does or other programs, that uh, they do have some real value for, for our Minnesota students. So I do support them in general, and I thought they had a good proposal, so that's why I decided to take it and, and see what we could do for it. So. Very good. Maybe one clarification. Representative Pinto. Thank you. And let me just a clarification from Ms. Denison Kanin. It, it, it seems like. Uh, uh, in terms of, I guess my thinking of it is if uh, we want to be supporting after school programs in general, it actually seems like you sort of are the after school programs in general people, uh, as far as I can tell in the state. So sort of you're the, you're the ones. Um, can you just confirm or, or clarify that? Ms. Dennison Kinane. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, and Representative Pinto, yes. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank Trying you. to get us back on that 10 minutes per presenter. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your time today. Uh, Ms. Howard. Uh, Ms. Dennison Kaneen mentioned full service community schools as a partner on uh, after school programming. Ms. Uh, Howard is the director of community engagement with the Minneapolis schools and has a long history uh, with full service community schools. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Thank Proceed you. with your testimony. Thank you, Patrice Howard. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair and conference committee members. Thank you for allowing the opportunity to speak with you to address the issue of funding for full service community schools. 
My name is Patrice Howard. I'm representing Minneapolis Public Schools as the Executive Director of Community Education, um, where, uh, and then formerly, excuse me, I was the Director of Community Schools in Brooklyn Center Community Schools, where I provided oversight uh, for the Full Service Community School Initiative, as well as technical assistance across the state, um, as well as support for neighboring states. As you may be aware, the needs of our students have changed. Many more students are speaking, seeking mental health supports, more students are experiencing trauma, and homelessness impacts far too many of our school-aged children. The Wilder Foundation survey of homelessness in 2018 showed the highest number of homelessness people um, ever surveyed. Most troubling in their data was the fact that 46% of homeless individuals are children or young people up to the age of 24. And those who do not have access to emergency shelter or family crisis centers was up from 62% since 2015. This is just one aspect of what the current student experience is. Schools must be equipped to, to work with students who have needs beyond academics. And we, we have to think beyond what most consider of schools today as serving a single purpose. Teachers teach and students learn. In order to, to impact learning space and the student experience, schools must be equipped to reduce the barriers of learning. Some of those barriers I referenced previously. Utilizing public schools as hubs, community schools bring together community partners to offer a range of supports and opportunities to youth, families, and communities. Community partners, in coordination with the coordinator for community schools and the school district, work to achieve these results. Children enter school ready to learn, Students attend school constantly, or consistently, excuse me. Students are actively involved in learning in their community. Families are increasingly involved within their child's education. Schools are engaged with families and communities. Students succeed academically. Students are healthy, physically, socially, and emotionally. Students live and learn in a safe and supportive and stable environment. And community becomes de desirable places to live. Before we, we Excuse me. Before we can begin the development of any full service community school, the work should be justified and identified through a needs assessment and then strength and asset mapping of the internal and the external community. I can attest to this model because I fully embraced this work for over seven years alongside families and communities in Brooklyn Center. As you may know, Brooklyn Center Community School is the state's first full service community school district. They began implementation of this model in 2009 and have produced positive results ever since, including increased graduation rates, attendance, on-site access to mental and health supports, medical mental health and um, supports, family engagement practices, such as increased leadership opportunities and basic needs supports, as well as enrichment programs for all youth. By welcoming community members as partners in school involvement and decision making, we, we are better able to reduce barriers to access by responding to the achievement and opportunity gaps through co-located, integrated, and coordinate, coordinated services of delivery that support student success. Full service community schools is a proven model of success with over five decades of research. I myself have the fortunate opportunity to serve on the Coalition for Community Schools Leadership Network which by the way, I just returned last week from that, great opportunity. We meet in person annually and then we convene a, a monthly phone call. So this network is um, it's an opportunity to be introduced to successful models across the country in places such as Binghamton, New York, where they have seen an increase in attendance rates in just a few years of its launch. Grand Rapids, Michigan, where they see, have seen a, an, um, excuse me, where they have where they are increasing graduation rates, attendance, positive school culture, and more. In Baltimore, Maryland, and Houston, Texas, they are increasing attendance rates by responding to homelessness, socioeconomics, and employment, and decreasing health care costs across those cities. New York uh, City, where the entire city has scaled its model and now the largest community school initiative in the country. This work is happening all over, including locally, where our friends in Duluth are focusing on student achievement by responding to absenteeism, health and family engagement through on-site supports. They're doing a great job, but they understand the, the need to do more across the district, as well as our friends in Rochester who are focusing on similar indicators of need. For us in Minneapolis, we're just beginning the work. And I'm also aware that there are a number of school districts across our state that are still interested in this model. 
So again, I want to thank you for the opportunity um, to really have this platform to discuss uh, opportunity to continue funding or allow funding for future community schools across our state. Thank you for your time. Um, that's all I have. Um, I welcome any questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I oh. take that back. I take that back. All right. All I right. have something to share with you all, which is a, a newer illustration from the Coalition for Community Schools. If, I can, if, if the page would help her out, please. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. And so it's just an illustration of a tree. Um, and it's like um, more so if you plant the seed, we work as a school, as community school uh, coordinators to harvest the fr fruit and the fruit being our, our young people, our students. So um, if you have any questions about that, I have a number of other materials that I can share. But due to time today, I want to allow you some questions. Thank you, Ms. Howard. Uh, questions from members? Did I see uh, Ms. Sanstead? Actually, Sanstead, not a me. question. I just want to thank you for that great presentation. Members, I just want to share with you, um, as a teacher, when I go back into the district, uh, when I'm not down here in St. Paul serving, I have the opportunity to meet with teachers from local uh, school districts, not my own, neighboring school districts, on a monthly basis. And in the district next to mine, there is a full-service community school. And... It, it is shocking to hear the reports of the teachers that come back and talk about the impact that, that those opportunities, that full service community school is having on the students and the difference it is making in their lives. In terms of really, in a full service community school, you have to assess the community and you look at your students, you identify partners, you identify needs, and it is really a come together kind of lift. Um, in the house, we heard testimony from Representative Mary Murphy, who talked about her experience as a child in school. And really, this is what our schools used to be. It was communities, families, schools, all coming together for the benefit of the student. And that is exactly what full service community schools do. They are absolutely specific to that community and those needs. So very unique to those needs serving the students in the ways they need to be served and really partnering with the um, community partners that are out there and identifying you know, what assets are there. And truly, this makes meaningful difference to students and their success in the classroom. And I just cannot say that with enough of an exclamation point afterwards. So thank you. Thank you, Reverend Sanstead. Any thank other you. questions uh, or comments from committee members? Ms. Howard, thank you very much. Oh, oh I'm sorry, me. Senator Nelson. Excuse me. I thought, I thought it looked like Senator Weger was, uh, had a question. I couldn't tell for sure. Um, Senator no, I didn't have a question. I was the chief author of it in the oh. Senate. Then. We're there. <laughs> All right. There He's we go. He's the thumbs up. <laughs> I have the question. Very good. Senator right. Nelson. So uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you, uh, Ms. Howard, for the, for the good testimony. And I've been to several of the uh, community schools um, in Rochester, and I know they've done phenomenal things. And I've seen the number of uh, community partners that have come uh, alongside these schools and, and made them terrific places uh, where we are seeing uh, good results. I just have a more of a detailed question, and I'm not sure if it would be addressed to you or to um, the um, finance chair, uh, to, to Chair Davney. So I'm looking at the spending chart here, the appropriations, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering uh, what are those appropriations used for? In other words, so what I've seen from our community schools is our community assets come in and they get behind our schools and they each bring their different focus that is incredibly helpful to our students. But what I don't see is, I don't know what the funding listed here provides. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if I could get some clarification on that. Um, the best I could tell is that there's a district organizer and a sub organizer. Mm -hmm. So those, so are these staff positions then for the people who are organizing mm -hmm. the all of the community partners to come in and, and work with the school. That's the best I can come up with. Maybe you can give me some further insight on that. Certainly, Madam Chair, you, you, you can't have coordina uh, community coordination without a coordinator mm -hmm. from the community. So, Ms. Howard, can you speak to the role since you've you sure. filled it? Sure, uh, thank you. You invented Mr. it Chair. here in Minnesota. <laughs> no, 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 I can't take that. 
<laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Um, yes, uh, what I, I do know, and I don't have all of the details, but I do know that there's funding um, that is uh, designated for a coordinator. So you do need to identify a coordinator who is responsible for one, um, conducting ongoing needs assessments, um, supporting the strengths and asset mapping, and then coordinating those partnerships that come about through the strengths and asset mapping. Um, and then also internally that coordinator is responsible uh, working directly with the principal and school staff, again on that ongoing needs assessment and really supporting uh, the needs of the, the whole school, uh, and most importantly the needs of the, the young person. And Ms. Howard, I, I think of it as, as the coordinator leverages the community assets. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Joachim. Oh, good. We can move. We can keep moving then. Ms. Right. Howard, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Happy Friday. Uh, and you. Uh, Dr. Chim Chimilo? Chimilo? My apologies, sir. This is the uh, Reach Out and Read program. Uh, and uh, thank you, Matthew. Um, I believe that my children benefited from this program. Uh, when they were of the appropriate age, infants, toddlers, uh, and uh, we'd take them to the clinic and they'd get books. So Dr. Chamilo? Chomolo. Chomolo. Mm -hmm. Chomolo. Dr. Chomolo, uh, formally state your name for the record, proceed with your testimony. Welcome to the committee and thank you for coming today. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair and committee for having us. Uh, my name is Dr. Nathan Chomolo. I'm a pediatrician and internist uh, that practices here in the Twin Cities. I also have the honor of serving as the uh, medical director for Reach Out and Read Minnesota. Um, so uh, we, we're uh, very grateful for uh, inclusion in the uh, House budget, uh, and we had a bill that uh, helps support uh, funding to expand our program throughout the state. Uh, and there was a Senate companion. I wanted to say thank you to the uh, Madam uh, Chair for her co-authoring on that as well. Um, so Reach Out and Read Minnesota trains physicians and nurse practitioners to equip parents to be their child's first teacher and pairs that with a developmentally appropriate book at their doctor's visit. Uh, this happens between the ages of six months and five years. Uh, this model has existed for uh, roughly 30 years and is backed by over a dozen peer-reviewed studies that demonstrate families served by clinics participating in Reach Out and Read are more likely to read to their children, that children score higher on expressive and receptive language scores, and that attendance at well-child checkups is increased. Part of our effectiveness stems from how we leverage the pre-existing healthcare infrastructure. Roughly 90% of children will see a medical provider at least once within their first year, while comparison only about 40% of children under the age of two are in licensed daycare centers. A pediatrician or family medicine doctor is not only a relatively constant presence in the first three years of a young child's life, but a trusted messenger that parents and caregivers depend on which is why interventions that use the healthcare infrastructure and meet families where they are at, like Reach Out and Read Minnesota, are the low-hanging fruit that we currently aren't reaping in efforts to ad address the opportunity gaps in early childhood. In fact, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Depeche Nefsari, who's the Reach Out and Read Wisconsin medical director, uh, has often said, if you throw in some money for some books, we'll throw in the doctors for free. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, gaps in oral vocabulary have been shown as early as 18 to 24 months of age, and there's evidence that children from low socioeconomic households have smaller oral vocabularies than their peers at age two, and that oral vocabulary at age two is a predictor of kindergarten academic performance and behavioral function. So children who aren't read to in that first 1,000 days of life have an increased risk of growing into adults who are illiterate and at risk for worse health outcomes. Reach Out and Read Minnesota has had impressive success with a relatively slim staff and budget. We currently reach over 40% of all children in Minnesota between the ages of six months and five years by engaging over 260 clinics and 1,100 providers in over 50% of the counties in Minnesota. However, we are reaching our capacity to not only continue growing, but maintain the high level of quality we have established throughout our clinics programs. A commitment from the state would not only help us with money to expand, but will signal to our current and future funders that our work not only produces results, but is primed for the next level of investment. Private-public partnerships are how we were able to get communities like Fairmont, Northfield, and Minneapolis to embrace our model and become bookend cities where every clinic in the city participates in Reach Out and Read at a high level. 
And Minneapolis, by the way, is the first major city and largest city in the country to achieve this distinction. So uh, to meet our goal of uh, making Minnesota book and state, where every clinic in the state um, participates in Reach Out and Read, support would be crucial. Um, and I just want to end that I have a two-year-old, and one of our favorite books right now is one that we actually received at our Reach Out and Read visit. Uh, it's called Love You, Hug You, Read to You. And it talks about uh, parents uh, and the three promises that they should have to love you, to hug you, to read to you every day. And so by supporting Reach Out and Read Minnesota, you are helping more parents around the state make the promise of reading to their children a reality by giving them a book and the tools to deliver that each and every day. Uh, thank you guys for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Chomolo. Questions from committee members for Dr. Chomolo? Okay. Uh, Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and Dr. Chomolo. So maybe I missed it somehow. Uh, how do you encourage the parents to read to their children? How do you Absolutely. establish? So uh, as, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, as um, as uh, parents will know, it's a little different reading to a six-month-old than it is to a two-year-old than it is to a five-year-old. And uh, there's an actual science behind reading. There's different techniques uh, around reading that are more effective depending on the child's developmental age and stage. And so we train providers. So all providers that participate in it go through about a 45-minute module. Uh, and then there's ongoing opportunities for education about the different techniques that parents can use, just like your pediatrician gives your children, uh, parents advice on sleep or feeding. It's just the same thing. Uh, unfortunately, I went through medical school, just graduated from the University of Minnesota Medical School in 2009, and I did not receive any training um, on techniques for reading out loud and the difference at different ages. And so uh, this is, it's a need uh, that's present in all our providers, and uh, it's something that we provide. Dr. Er, let's get this right. Representative Erdahl. I think there is a Dr. Erdahl, but that would be my son. <laughs> that's true. That's true. There is. Um, so... I mean, how do you actually engage the parents in doing this? Dr. Chomolo? So uh, a lot of it is modeling. So we start the, every visit uh, with the book. Um, so between six months and five years when you're going in to take them for their checkups, for their shots and or weight, um, I'll, I'll walk into the book. And the first thing, I, you know, I don't even look at the parents. I look at the child. I give the child the book and see what happens between the child and me, between the child and the parent, the child and their sibling. And then I start talking about, you know, they're uh, six months today and their eyes are really, you know, focused on uh, contrast, high contrast, black and white. And so what we're really going to do today is we're just going to work on having them hold the book and learn how to turn the pages so that they know that this is the right side up for a book. Um, and then at the next visit, we'll talk about how we start talking about pointing out different colors or different numbers. And so there's a number of skills at each visit um, that we train providers uh, what are the things you can hone in on? And then how do you model that for the parents so that they feel that this is something they can do when they go home? Mr. Representative Erdahl. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to, uh, I commend you for, for working that way with, uh, with children and with parents. My, a quick story. My uh, daughter-in-law reads to my grandson, two-year-old Eli, every night. He gets three stories. <laughs> And uh, he's very taken with this, and he wants four stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and his mother said, no, you only get three. To which he said, how about the Bible, Mommy? <laughs> <laughs> She's a good negotiator. <laughs> he, he got a fourth story. He got a fourth story. Well done. Uh, fr from the Bible? Or <laughs> Representative Joachim. Dr. Tomala, I just want to thank you for this. I think your program is amazing, and it's a prime example of meeting children where they're at. Um, having doctors and pediatricians and hopefully general practitioners, our daughter's going to UMD Med School for general practice, and I'm going to encourage her to look at this program wherever she ends up practicing. Um, it's such an important thing for parents to understand, and sometimes new parents are just so overwhelmed by everything going on. They don't have, maybe have the skill set or the time to really dive into things that they realize can really make a difference. And you're helping them in a, in a safe environment where they can finally stop and they're ready to engage and listen to what their child needs. And I just want to thank you. Uh, Senator Weger. Oh, well, thank you. And you know, we're all just very appreciative. But I was wondering, I didn't see the obstetricians on here. And, of course, you know, reading while well, mom's expecting and music uh, and others participating, you know, just some comments on that regarding that important part of the process. Dr. Chomolo. 
Um, yes, uh, thank you for that question. Um, Minnesota is actually one of the few areas where we actually are piloting and leading the nation in that health partners, um, uh, which I work for, has a program where at the 32 week visit, uh, the moms, expected moms and dads get a book and they talk about that. As part of the reach out and read model, it's not yet uh, part of our overall model. Uh, and, uh, and part of that is we're trying to first reach the children between six months and five years. Uh, but that's certainly something that um, you know, down the road, uh, hopefully once we're able to expand statewide, we'd be able to deepen the impact and engagement because uh, in particular, this is what's called the dose dependent intervention, meaning the more times you get exposed to it, the more likely it is to change your behavior. And we know that obstetricians in particular are one of the most trusted uh, uh, physicians from families and mothers. And so that's something that's definitely on our radar. Um, we're just looking to expand first. Right. Just no, uh, Senator Weger and midwives, and, you know, doulas and mm -hmm. others would be a part of that. All right. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Dr. Chumolo. Thank you so much for the presentation and uh, for your leadership in this. I just have a couple uh, other things I, I would like to know. Um, so, tell me a little bit about uh, the scaling of this. So, right now, uh, forty percent of all kids in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Um, have the ability to uh, be seen by a pediatrician who's uh, participating in Reach Out and Read. Now, do you have a map of where those students are? And uh, it'd be wonderful to see where is the impact of this now and where are the spots where it is not. Um, if you could maybe talk uh, just in some basic uh, uh, geography about where, where our kids are being served with uh, Reach Out and Read. Dr. Chomo. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, we, we do have a map. We actually had our annual breakfast um, just on Wednesday where we kind of update it for the year. And um, I, I'm sorry I didn't uh, include that in the supplements. Uh, it, it, it's based off of the number of clinics participating out of potential clinics. Um, and so that's where you can see that we have um, a lot of density in the Twin Cities and metro area, but some of actually our um, most well representative counties are in greater Minnesota. Um, and, uh, and the way that we have approached and plan on approaching expansion is to kind of overlay that map where there's spots uh, and counties in Minnesota where there are absolutely no reach out and read uh, clinics with um, the Wilder's uh, Risk, Reach, and Resilience Report about where there's the greatest need. Um, and so kind of focusing first on the, where there's no clinics and where's the greatest need and then kind of moving from in that direction. And so uh, that's our, our plan, um, you know, with, with or without funding, but um, certainly funding would help us uh, uh, make that go faster. Senator Nelson. Okay, and then um, how is it being funded now? Uh, yes. Dr. Tromolo. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, uh, primary funding uh, does come from uh, the health systems that do it, um, and uh, they buy the books themselves. Uh, some, a lot, many of our uh, smaller clinics uh, that are serving some of the most under-resourced communities, uh, we provide the books for them, and so we do that through uh, foundations and uh, f uh, fundraising, uh, either through corporations or um, individual donors. Thank you. And then just Senator Nelson. another follow-up mm -hmm. question. And so, well, one, I want to commend you on the early reading. Uh, and also, we know pediatricians are really some of those most trusted uh, professionals that parents go to as they're, especially as they're experiencing their first child and all the changes. So I think you're in a unique role to make this kind of an impact. Um, but, you know, we know there's such pressure on our health care system. And we know that um, our doctors are being squeezed as far as the amount of time that they can spend with patients. And I'm just curious, um, how, uh, how is it that you're able to, um, is it an agreement from the providers? The, um, I, I mean, it's quite remarkable uh, that um, our, our pediatricians are able to actually spend this type of time with uh, parents and their child. And I'm just wondering how those, you know, as I said, these are our health providers, highly competitive, cr increasingly uh, crushed with um, costs and the ability uh, to have uh, that um, access that our patients need. So just kind of explain a little bit how it's, it's kind of a bit of a miracle that you can do this. I'm just curious how that's, uh, how you're able to do that. Dr. Chumala. Uh Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, or Chairwoman. Um, it, it's a point that's brought up every time is, you know, every uh, year it seems like we're asked to squeeze more and more in less time. Um, but 
uh, from my personal experience, uh, this is something that actually builds upon what we're already doing uh, as far as anticipatory guidance. Uh, and when you get more experience from the training that we provide, you actually see that it helps with certain things like developmental surveillance, right? So I know just within 30 seconds from giving a child a book, you know, how is their social interaction with me or with their parent or their, their siblings? What's their motor function? Are they able to hold the book? Uh, what's, is there troubles with their vision? Can they see what the things I'm pointing to? What's the issue with their vocabulary? And so all of that, it would take much longer if I tried to kind of go through my little checkbook and ask, uh, ask each you know, thing uh, in a more formal way. And so um, from that standpoint, it's very beneficial. And then we know that uh, uh, families value uh, their pediatrician or family practice provider um, as more helpful when they participate in Reach Out and Read. And we know from our evidence that the providers that do it actually enjoy their practice more doing it. And so uh, even though there are, is sometimes some hesitation, almost universally uh, providers will come back to me and say, I can't imagine practicing without it at once this gets going. And so, um, yeah, there, there's, those are certainly some kind of the barriers to expanding to some clinics, but um, we have had really good success uh, showing our value. Thank you. Then, Senator. Thank you. Uh, and so with the appropriation uh, that you've requested, um, how do you feel the program will be scaled? What percent of, uh, how, how, how much more uh, will you be able to, how many more providers or what more, uh, what greater percent of student, of children, uh, young children will, will be reached? Dr. Chomo. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman. That is a good question. Uh, so it would depend on, um, you know, the, the initial approach would be to go towards those communities that we kind of said don't have a reach out and read clinic or uh, are at the highest risk. Um, and kind of we had some of those in greater Minnesota require more relationship building than, uh, you know, we already currently have existing relationships in the Twin Cities area. And so to give you like a hard number on, you know, how much with this amount of funding would be uh, difficult to do. Our overall goal is uh, looking at uh, percent of counties that we actually have a presence in. And so um, uh, this would be a good first step at kind of uh, increasing that percentage uh, from roughly 50%, um, uh, you know, to, to, you know, the this amount of funding probably would be able to get closer to 60%, but it, it's, you know, to go statewide uh, would require kind of a significant more amount of funding. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I'd just say that uh, this is unique in that, do you model uh, reading then for the parents? Yes, absolutely. Yes. absolutely. I think this is unique uh, to your program. We have other wonderful programs that seek to get books into the hands of young children. Dolly Parton has the, I think it's called the Learning Library. Imagination Library. Imagination Library, much better term. <laughs> um, and, uh, but this is very unique in that you're able to model for parents that great reading. So thank you for the good <laughs> presentation. Thank you, Doc. Oh, Representative Pinto, how could we discuss early childhood without <laughs> and Representative Pinto? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was uh, I had my hand up earlier. I thought you maybe Apologies. were saving me for low. No problem. Save me for last because you knew I was so so excited about this. But I'll try to be quick. I know we have so much to get through. Um, but yeah, this is an amazing amazing program. And I guess I wanted to to note that not only my understanding is not only are pediatricians making time for it, but actually at least I've been contacted by many. I mean, they are they are demanding this. They are calling for this, for the expansion, for getting this into more and more places, being so eager um, to have it. And I guess I wanted to highlight um, uh, just one note that came up in our Early Childhood Committee about um, the concerns of having screen time with little, little kids, right? I think many of us just intuitively know what a bad thing that is. And it did occur to me, just even as you were talking now, that even just that power of getting those actual physical books in front of kids and parents, to Chair Nelson's point, um, hopefully gets our littlest kids on a path where they're not then um, being put in front of a screen, uh, hopefully at all, certainly much less um, than they may be, um, and really getting that book. And I guess, um, and that final point, just to highlight your, your point, uh, Dr. Chomolo, about um, the, uh, the, develop, the, the power of the tool of the book. I'm, I'm wondering maybe a stethoscope versus a book, and you have to sort of decide sometimes, I might wonder, because the book um, tells you such amazing things and such a powerful tool I've heard from pediatricians um, that they have, even just inside the room, much less when the child and parent get home and what they do with the book after that. Um, I did want to ask Dr. Chomolo, maybe you can um, uh, see if you can provide that information to the committee about uh, the current reach of the program and then any thoughts you may have about, about what this funding would do. Um, but thank you for your leadership and, um, and again, hearing from many, many uh, health providers, pediatricians about this. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Chomolo. Yeah, uh, 
Thank you, Representative Pinto. Uh, yeah, I often will start a visit by actually taking a phone uh, or tablet out of a child's hand and putting the book in it, um, uh, and kind of then modeling. And you know, initially parents might be hesitant, but then they see how the child lights up around the book uh, and she wants to share it with others. And so it's been a great way to kind of talk about just not saying no, 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 you don't want screens, you don't want screens, but actually giving tools of what are other things you can do uh, to kind of get away from screens. What are the things that we know best engage the brain? Uh, and then to your uh, other point about a uh, stethoscope versus a book, uh, I'll again cite my colleague, uh, Dr. Depeche Nafsari, when he testified in front of the United States Congress about the importance of this. Uh, he said, and I agree with, that if a child is otherwise healthy, no other concerns, uh, I would much ma rather go into a visit for a well child check with a book at this age than a stethoscope because it will give me so much more information about things that impact that child's health and trajectory. So. Um, uh, again, thank you for your time. Representative Pinto had suggested I leave with a dad joke, if that's all right. Oh, please. <laughs> Since we're talking about getting our children ready for school, um, what did the buffalo say to his son when he left for college? Hi, son. Hi, no. uh, <laughs> son. I'm, um, I'm, I'm not sure whether to say thank you or not, but <laughs> <laughs> the dad joke was a fact. <laughs> thank you. Senator. For the record, Mr. Chairman, the first Saturday of June is Buffalo Days in Laverne, Minnesota. So. Okay, there you go. There you go. Uh, moving on. Thank you very much. Uh, continuing with doctors, Dr. Oliphant. You and ah. Dr. Oliphant, welcome to the committee. Thank, uh, you. thank you very much uh, for coming. It looks like there might be some handouts coming forward. Uh, and you're with the University of Minnesota. If you can just bring us up to speed on what part, it's a big institution, and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Chair, I am Jenny Oliphant. I am the uh, Community Outreach Coordinator and a Research Associate <laughs> for the University of Minnesota's Prevention Research Center in the Division of Adolescent Health in the Medical School. I'm here today just to reiterate some of the information that has already been uh, 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 put forth in earlier testimony regarding comprehensive sexual health education. Uh, the University of Minnesota's Prevention Research Center is a link between <coughs> research and practice. And our main goals in the Prevention Research Center is to collaborate with both public health agencies, education agencies, and community-based organizations in order to support and help young people not just survive, but thrive in their communities. Uh, the Prevention Research Center has uh, put forth a brief for you so that you can see in terms of comprehensive sex sexual health education, some of the important information that plays into the role of providing sexual health education for young people in the state of Minnesota. The number one thing to, to recognize for people in the state of Minnesota is that parents from all parts of Minnesota support comprehensive sexual health education for their children. In the brief that is going around, you will see that this is a statewide support and is not just metro-based. And in each area, the support is greater than, uh, than uh, it's at 89% or greater, reaching a, a high of 94% with, this, uh, with the research that we have done at our Prevention Research Center through Dr. Myla Eisenberg. Another important point is that comprehensive se sexual health education teaches consent and healthy relationship. As a community health educator myself, one who still spends time working in communities teaching sexual health education, I can tell you that the issue of consent is extremely important. Young people are asking how to do this. In the era in which we currently live, young people do not have a framework of how to consent without some education. <clears throat> Yet they know very well that consent is an important issue for them. Comprehensive sexual health education includes more than just uh, sexual parts, the typical conversation about birds and bees, and goes much more beyond that to teach these issues such as consent, which is so important in our current era. We also know that teaching consent can reduce sexual violence. We know from previous research that 17% of our 11th graders report some form 
of intimate partner, partner violence in our state. And so, again, with se comprehensive sexual education, this particular issue can be addressed. Fourth, I or third, I think it's really important to understand that comprehensive sexual education is important and, and is effective. In the world of, of the most uh, sexually transmitted diseases that we've ever had, our federal government the, and the Centers for Disease Control is looking for ways to creatively uh, control STDs and um, HIV. <coughs> comprehensive sexual education is among some of those answers. We know that comprehensive sexual education helps young people to wait, and we have seen a decrease in teen pregnancy in our state because young people are both waiting longer and using more effective forms of contraception. It also uh, reduces the number of sexual partners and it increases contraceptive and condom use. It's also important to recognize that comprehensive sexual health education includes abstinence education. It is not an abstinence only method, but includes abstinence as a, a viable and healthy choice, one that young people of can make throughout their, their youth as well as adults can into the future. Abstinence only programs do not describe the comprehensive nature uh, of sexual health and the needs that young people need to know in order to uh, proceed into a healthy adult life as a healthy, literate young person for themselves. Abstinence only uh, programs have, been, have, have shown the, that they are not effective in lowering teen pregnancy or STI rates. They have not been shown to reduce the number of sexual partners, and they have not reduced unprotective sexual activity. There's a big distinction between that and comprehensive sexual health education that offers abstinence um, as an option. I want to conclude by saying that in the 10 counties in Minnesota where we had the highest birth rates. They were in greater Minnesota, locations where we do not have um, the number of adolescent-friendly clinics or adolescent-available clinics for young people. So it's important that young people get their sexual health education at school uh, so that they can, as I said earlier, proceed into adulthood with both knowledge, information, and a sense of having control over their future. Uh, with that, I'd like to conclude and uh, answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Questions from members? Thank you very much. You made a, a compelling argument that uh, uh, the current approach is, is failing too many of our young people and that we need to look at what works and what the research shows to be more effective as well as what has uh, broad support from, from parents and providers uh, as the best way forward for, for our young people today. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you coming down. Mr. Oh, Chair, Representative Pinto. I said, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I'll, I just did just want to note, because um, uh, I don't serve um, on the education uh, committees, was able to hear this. I was in, in the early childhood committee. But I just want to note, as somebody who's, um, I prosecute, uh, crimes of gender violence and my work outside the legislature and actually focused in particular on the sexual exploitation of youth um, of young people. I directed statewide training and protocol development for the safe harbor system, which is the um, our statewide approach uh, to identify and to prevent uh, the exploitation of young people and to hold uh, accountable those um, who've committed that. And actually, you've had a, a number of trials that re result in lengthy sentences, prison sentences for those who've done that um, to young people. And, uh, and I will say just from that perspective, um, that uh, that knowledge is is power, and that having um, uh, comprehensive sexual health education is something that I think is absolutely critical for our for our young people, um, and to uh, to empower them. Um, there's there's I guess there's more that I could say about that in connection with with my work, um, but I'll simply say that from a number of perspectives, um, I think this is uh, this is just such powerful and such important work. So I thank you, um, thank the testifier, and um, I'm certainly very glad to have this be. Um, included in, uh, uh, in the House bill that's moved forward, and I certainly hope that it's something that we can move forward on as a state for the benefit of our young people and, and for all of us. So thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Pinto. Representative Erdahl, were you asking to be recognized? Yeah. Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Dr. Oliphant. Um, you know, I, I don't doubt your statistics that a lot of parents uh, are supportive of this, um, but in my particular district, I'm not hearing from them. I'm hearing in 
fairly large numbers from folks who are not. And I'll just read a quick typical uh, communication I'm receiving and uh, ask you how I should answer. Um, I would like to add my voice to put a stop to the comprehensive sexual health education bill. As a parent and a grandparent, I believe it is my responsibility to teach those things to my own children. It is not the school district's job to do this. They have many more responsibilities. Dr. Oliphant. Mr. Chair, um, I, I agree that it is a very important role. I, I can't think of any sexual health educator who would not want parents to be the primary sexual health educator of their young children. The values that parents transmit are very important, and we want young people to know what those values are. For a parent that would like that, them to be the only pro sexual health educator and not the school, an opt-out uh, option does exist within the legislation, as, uh, as I understand it, and um, is a typical format for comprehensive sexual health education. And so any parent should not feel threatened that they could not do that. They could, in fact, opt them out. I also hope that young people would be calling you because the young people also represent who is coming up in the future and they have a different life that they are facing with the number of STIs, sexually transmitted infections that we have right now. Uh, Representative Rodal, just uh, assurance to you and, and committee members, the language in the House bill does nothing to change uh, the current requirements in state statute that parents, uh, that, that the curriculum be made available to parents and that they have the opportunity to opt, them, opt out uh, their child out of uh, this part of a, a health curriculum. Uh, and the language further requires that the local curriculum uh, be developed with uh, the community and with community values in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, was there opposition in the House? We did not hear this bill. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm just wondering if there was any opposition in the House uh, regarding this. This came through the Policy Committee. Representative Joachim? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair. We had a healthy conversation, and it passed out of the House Policy Committee. It passed out of the Education Finance Committee, and it passed off the House floor. Were, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Madam however Chair. it works. Yeah. Yes, both. Uh, um, Senator Nelson. So, and were they um, bipartisanly supported? Was it uh, just, you know, I'm just trying to get a sense of the discussion that took place in that policy committee. Um, Representative you. Yukim. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the policy committee, I was actually, we had a lot of discussion, but not a lot of amendments offered. But we did have some amendments offered on the floor that we accepted, one of which was to really highlight the ability for parents to be able to opt out and for schools to be able to pick who they wanted to teach this. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chip? Uh, Senator Nelson. Yep. And uh, so I did see part of the House debate on the floor, and I would say it was highly controversial, one of the most controversial uh, discussions that I've uh, seen. But what I would say is um, my emails have been somewhat like um, Senator or Representative Erdahl's. Sorry about that. Representative Erdahl's in that I would say this has been the most uh, controversial piece of any uh, thing that I have uh, received emails on in the um, education omnibus bill. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, I think uh, it's a little bit unfortunate that the public didn't know that this would be a topic today because I have a sense the room uh, would have been packed. Um, but I noticed that the, um, s the agenda just said various House budget provisions, so I didn't know. Is there a budget piece attached to this provision? Uh, Madam Chair, the, the uh, agenda that went out uh, included budget and policy dis discussions, just as yours did yesterday. Oh, yes. Uh, oh, the one I have just says review of various House budget provisions, uh, but regardless. And, and no, that, that was updated this morning oh. if you'd kept, if you were uh, current with okay. your emails. Sure, sure. So, but the point is, I don't know if the public knew that. Uh, and so I'm not, and I don't know that, you know, you would have entertained uh, a public testimony, mm -hmm. but I do want to be on the record uh, stating that um, this is a highly controversial uh, topic. Um, I did watch, as I said, part of that House debate, one of the most controversial uh, debates that I've heard, and certainly uh, the 
the uh, email response would indicate that as well. So I do want to make sure that that's on the record mm -hmm. and note that, um, and I want to make sure you're well aware of that mm -hmm. too. I don't know if your email has been uh, filling up like that, but you were on the House floor, yes. so you certainly yes. saw all that. Well, Senator Nelson, I, I think what we what we see is amongst a small percentage of the population, it's, it's very controversial. But Dr. Oliphant's uh, data the polling is, I, th I think it's funny that my own congressional district is amongst the lowest in the state with 89% of parents wanting comprehensive sexuality e education available for their young people. Uh, and uh, let's see, you're the uh, first district, 94% uh, in the first district of parents polled want to see comprehensive sexuality education for their young people. So for the vast majority, vast majority of parents, this is not controversial. For a small group, it, it is. Uh, but Minnesota has had a requirement in state law for sexuality education since 1988. That's, is it 30 years or 40 years? 30 years. Um, so this is, this is not new. This is uh, looking at what works for students and using research to <coughs> support that. And what we see, I, I believe Dr. Oliphant, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, we're seeing uh, high rates of sexually transmitted infections. Uh, and the best way to respond to that is to arm students with uh, education, prepare them for adulthood. Mr. Senator Nelson. Yeah, and, to, and just to uh, add to that, um, certainly I can guarantee you that uh, it is not 94% uh, support of the comprehensive sex education in the first district, although it might depend on how, how that's defined and who is providing that education. I think the House bill, uh, if I'm not mistaken, allows um, so-called community experts or some folks to come in who are not licensed teachers to provide this type of uh, very uh, sensitive um, education. So I think you know there are some real issues as, as this uh, provision, if this provision were to um, move forward. But I do want to uh, put that on the record that, that it is of a great concern. And it is true, you're right, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have had these um, standards in our health education mm -hmm. for a very long time. And I think what the House is proposing is something vastly different than those current uh, standards. And so I think that's something that um, I know there's a good deal of the public, I wouldn't say it's a small, amount of uh, the public uh, who are very concerned about this. So we mm -hmm. want to make sure that that's on the record and it's quite possible that uh, they may feel they have the need to have their voices uh, heard as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you. And thank I, you I, very much. I do uh, recognize that the uh, language in the House bill allows guest speakers to come in just under the supervision of the teacher of record, just as uh, when I was a uh, social studies teacher, I, I actually would have uh, now Senator Anderson uh, come in and speak, or I would have other speakers coming in that were appropriate to the curriculum and had perspectives, expertise uh, that were b beyond my training. So I would certainly hope we wouldn't ban uh, guest speakers from our schools. Uh, Representative Sandstead. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair and members. Um, I just want to add to this conversation, there was lengthy floor debate but unfortunately, a great deal of the debate that happened on the floor was around misinformation. It was around uh, language that is not included in this bill and referencing materials that by no means are part of the language. And I have heard from a tremendous amount of my constituency on the misinformation. And I think it's really important, important that when we have this conversation that we are thoroughly transparent in dealing with the facts of the language and not the misinformation that has gotten out because that took off like wildfire, but it is misinformation and inaccuracies. Thank you, Representative Sanstead. Representative Joachim. Thank, um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I also wanted to say that um, so much of the underlying language remains with parental opt-out, parental review of the curriculum, uh, guest speakers like we have in every other aspect of our schools, like um, McPhail that came in yesterday, those are guest teachers under the supervision of a, of a licensed teacher. So, you know, I don't think we have to worry that much about that because also we added, I forgot to mention the amendment we added on the floor that parents have to be notified about the guest speaker that's coming in mm -hmm. ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So that was an important amendment that we accepted as well. Um, and. You know, I have to echo what uh, Representative Sandsteed said, the, the 
the um, emails that I received, um, not very many from my district, a lot from around the state, from you know little bits here and there from around the state. When I presented them with what was in the bill and explained, they were surprised. They might still disagree, but they're like, oh, that's not what I hear. I heard a book read on the floor that you're going to use. Let me rest assured, there is no curriculum in this bill. This allows MDE and the Department of Health to point to some model programs that are out there that districts could use. It sets suggestions of where we should, what we should be teaching, and maybe we do have to have this more broad-based standard discussion later, too, on what standards we need to add to our health curriculum. But it just points to model curriculum. The districts can decide whether or not they're going to use it in conjunction with working with their community values. All the, uh, all the districts have to do is sign a letter of assurance that they're going to teach, teach something, just like they do with the standards, and then report what they ended up using. There is no curriculum in this bill. There is no model program in this bill. It points to model programs that districts could use if they so choose. All we're saying is our kids need accurate, medically accurate information to make sure that they stay healthy and safe. And that's the point of this bill. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. And just, Senator Nelson. Just to follow up. So there, this has been a good discussion because mm -hmm. uh, obviously we do allow guest speakers. Mm -hmm. And there, there's, and so why do we, I mean, and, you know, I'm just still trying to figure out what is the <coughs> genesis of this particular provision, if it's not standards, it's not curriculum, uh, and uh, we ha allow guest speakers. So I'm, what is the goal then of this program, if it, or this particular initiative? Um, because we already have standards. We allow guest speakers already. And so what is it that you're trying to achieve with the proposal that is not already, uh, you know, our school boards determine uh, so much? So I'm just curious, what, what's the, what, what are you trying to achieve here? Why, why do we need this legislation if we already have these things in place? Chair Yukin. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm glad you asked that because it um, gives me an opportunity to explain how we arrived at this. So you all know we had a big turnover in the House, so we have a lot of new, excited, energetic members, and a few of them approached me. One of them is our chief author, uh, Reverend, I mean, representative, he is also Reverend uh, Lippert, and our two resident doctors, I know you have some resident doctors in the Senate, too, came to me and said, you know, we're not seeing enough consistency around the state of how this is approached. You know, what can we try to do this year? So we sat down, um, the four of us, along with Representative Kunish Boudin, who's been a champion on this issue as well, and started brainstorming and trying to figure out um, what, what the best approach was. We looped M MDE in a little early on, too, to talk about what they'd be willing to do, and this is what we came up with. So um, we're pretty proud of it. We do want the consistency. We do want the benchmarks. And I believe this is a really good, uh, good step towards that. So, and, and Senator Nelson, I'd, I'd sum up at least my understanding of the goals. My, my goals in this is to prepare children for adulthood. It's to keep them safe and healthy, whether that's in you know, their own uh, personal development and, and sexual activity, or to Rep Chair Pinto's point, um, keeping them out of being sexually exploited, sexually abused, sexually trafficked. Um, I think if we can reduce the uh, amount of sexual trafficking in the state, uh, the amount of sexual abuse, I think that's a positive. And I think this update to uh, state statute that's been in place for 30 years now uh, is timely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Nelson. Um, and so uh, no disagreement there. However, the concern is that the House provision requires the program to include instructions on topics in the model program. So suddenly, the state uh, is going to say what this model program is and what must be included. And we are strong believers in local control. Mm -hmm. And we also know that there are those statewide standards that our schools must uh, prepare their children for. And yet, this is taking something that is not a statewide standard, and yet it's making it a statewide standard. because. It is requiring that the program include instruction on topics in the model program. And yet, who determines the model program? And, um, and the, the, the point to uh, uniformity, uh, being uniform, is you know, when you have local control, it isn't always 
uniform. And that's why we have state standards mm -hmm. on those things. But I'm very fearful that what, you're, what this uh, House provision is attempting to do is to make this a statewide standard of instruction on a highly sensitive topic that most agree belongs most in the home. Uh, and yet it's going to be in our schools and in our classrooms with some of our youngest students. And yet we are requiring schools to include instruction on those topics in the model program. So I find that I think there is a, a lot of power here uh, that is being given to uh, the model program, whatever that is, and a lot of suppressing <coughs> of that local control and that school board uh, power. So there is a great deal of uh, concern about this. and. Um, we were unaware that uh, the controversial type issues uh, would be discussed today, but I do want you to know there is there is great concern uh, over this uh, proposal. Well, uh, Senator Nelson, I'll just close out the conversation here. Uh, this has been in our schools and our classrooms for the last 30 years, so there's there's no change to that. Uh, we explicitly respect local control with the language in the bill because we leave it up to the local communities to develop the curriculum. As long as it's in the model program. As we do the local social studies curriculum, as long as it complies with state standards. So we, we provide guidance, uh, MDE and MDH, so the people with, with expertise uh, are the ones who, who identify model, research-based, proven effective programs that districts can choose as models, at which point the districts then engage their communities and develop the curriculum. So very mindful of local control, very <coughs> mindful of respecting local districts. So, Mr. Dr. Oliphant, thank you very much for, for coming today. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Oh. Appreciate it. Oh. <coughs> uh, Re Representative Pinto. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, I just want to clarify one point, um, just because I was getting a little bit confused on it. Um, uh, Chair Nelson had said several times that the, the district's program would have to be, have to contain the content from the model program. And as I read this, and maybe, how, maybe our research staff can just confirm, as I read this, the requirement is that the program simply um, has to cover the same topics as are listed for the model program topics. Um, and uh, I mean, specifically, and I, you know, Basically, these are topics that I think we presumably would all agree that such a program should include. So it's not necessarily the content from the model program, um, but it does need to cover the topics of human anatomy, uh, consent, bodily autonomy, abstinence, and other methods uh, for preventing unintended pregnancy, the relationship between substance abuse, sexual behavior, and health. In other words, topics that I think we all would agree. Maybe if we could just get clarification that, that I'm reading that correctly. L last comment. Ms. Perra, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Pinto, that's correct. Those are topics that that the schools would have to cover. Okay, and, and so Mr. Chair, just confirming, so the district really does have the power to decide uh, what is covered, and that just has to cover those topics um, uh, that, are, that are the same as are covered the model program, but not necessarily that same content. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Oliphant, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Peters from Richardson Elementary. Uh, so uh, just a little, we could have just a final comment on that, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We're for your, trying to move on. I understand. Thank you. I'll be very brief. Uh, so yes, to the point, uh, those academic standards for health are locally developed mm -hmm. academic standards. And uh, the legislation says that whatever those model programs are has to be included. But I just have to say that it just draws, it's a, there's a bit of a, a disconnect here, I think, when some have said, well, we want to make sure that we have a breakfast after the bell for all kids because some kids feel like, uh, you know, they um, are maybe embarrassed to be one of those kids that gets breakfast and not all the kids in the school do. And I think that's a, 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 perhaps a, a, a rightful argument. But yet on the other hand, the um, opt-out provisions in this bill uh, say that these children and their parents have to be willing to say, well, we don't want to be part of this uh, of this particular instruction. And it just seems to me that there's a real disconnect there about what we are asking our students uh, to do if they want to opt <laughs> in or opt out or something. So uh, that'll be my final final comment sure. for today. And sure. thank you for, um, for your indulgence on Certainly. That. Just remind you that the opt-out provisions are current law and have been for decades. Uh, Ms. Peters, is it? Let me see. Yes. Ms. Peters and Mr. Perry on trauma-informed schools. If you could please. Introduce yourself for the tape and proceed. 
Hi, good, good afternoon. My name is Jenna Peters. I'm a principal at Richardson Elementary School. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, I'm here today to testify on behalf of the Trauma-Informed School Incentive Aid. We think of school as a place where students learn to read, write, and do math, and this is true. We also know that students come to school with more pressing needs. Hungry because lunch at school was the last thing they had to eat. Tired because they're homeless and don't have a quiet place to sleep. Scared because the police were called to their house for domestic violence or sad because a parent or sibling has passed away. These are the students we serve. Students impacted by trauma with aces stacked against them. When we think about school, the first question we need to ask is not about holding children accountable to learning. The first question to ask is how do we support all children so they're ready to learn? I routinely work with children with multiple ACEs, students who come to school hours after seeing a parent arrested, a shooting in their community, or after being evicted from their home. We live in a world that expects these children to come to school ready to learn. Our work starts with building trusting, positive relationships and then connecting students to supports. Supports that we have put in place at Richardson include professional development for teachers in trauma responsive practices, weekly school-based therapy, a check and connect system to support students with high behavior needs, often as a result of their trauma, and implementing restorative practices. Last year, we began doing trauma-informed work in our building, and our work is positively impacting our students. The work we're do doing to build community with and among our students through restorative practices is paying off. We are on track this year to reduce our out-of-school suspensions by 80%. 80% from last year to this year. Last year we had 29 out of school suspension, suspensions and this year we have five. But it's not just that our students are spending more time in school, they're also spending more time in their classrooms learning. Our office referrals are down 30% from last year and there's a handout I believe that went around that kind of shows some of that work. And I do want to say if you're looking at that handout first, like so many schools we do have a terrible discipline disparity gap. We need to do something about that. And in just one year, we've had significant drops in office referrals for our kids of color. In just one year, there is so much hope. A 43% drop in our office referrals for our black students, a 41% drop for our multiracial students, and a 39% drop for our Latino kids. We know that the school to prison pipeline begins with discipline in schools and we are addressing that pipeline. Trauma-informed practices work and we are just starting on our journey. Including this in the final bill will give educators the ability to build teacher capacity while increasing and expanding supports for more student access to things like therapy and social workers. Administrators and educators can create trauma-informed plans that can have lasting impacts in our classrooms and for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Perry, welcome to the uh, committee. Please state your name for the record. Proceed. Tim Perry, uh, thank you for having us here today. Um, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jim Perry, and I lead the REACH program at Stewartville High School and Middle School. REACH stands for Relationships, Education, Accountability, Character, and Hard Work. This is our fifth year of REACH in Stewartville, and REACH is an elective class offered for students in grades 7 through 12. Uh, I also am the 2019 Human Rights Award winner for Education Minnesota for my work with trauma-informed and responsive education. I'd like to tell you today a little bit more about my work. REACH started as an academic intervention for students struggling in their core classes, but quickly grew into much more than that. 80% of my students have experienced one or more adverse childhood experiences. 55% have four or more. 36% have six or more. And 18% have eight or more. And this is out of a scale of 10 on the original ACEs questionnaire. This is Stewartville, a small greater Minnesota community. Mm -hmm. Senator Nelson, this is our community. You've been to my classroom and you have seen this. Thank you for taking the time in seeing that ACEs are everywhere. This population has too often been underserved by our schools. This is due to many factors. They struggle academically. They also often have behavior issues the educator who is not trauma-informed in responses to the special needs of these students isn't equipped to help them navigate through life. REACH does that. Growing up in today's world is not easy. There are many outside factors that impact our students on a daily basis. 
Trauma is one of them. So here's the harsh reality of ACEs. The child who enters kindergarten with an ACEs score of three or four will likely have that score double or more by the time they graduate from high school. For far too many students, adverse childhood experiences are life experiences. These life experiences affect everything from mental and physical health to relationships and academics. Our students can't simply be fixed with a temporary response. Trauma-informed and responsive education isn't a fad. It isn't going away. This is the reality of ACEs. For some, this is life. As teachers, we must understand that our students are a product of all of their experiences, both good and bad. We must not let their ACEs define them. It's our responsibility to help them find their own strength, meaning, and purpose, despite these obstacles, so they can grow up to be happy, healthy, and productive adults. This is how the cycle gets broken, and we are an important part of this process. While adopting a growth mindset is our goal for all students, this can be especially difficult for our students who have experienced trauma in a lifetime of events that in most cases are out of their control. Teaching these students is not just an academic exercise. It means rewiring the brain that has been firmly set in a mixed mindset. This simply can't be done in just one lesson, unit, quarter, semester, or school year. It took much longer for this mindset to be rooted in their personality, and it will take much time and patient, patience for it to be unlearned. So what does it mean to be trauma-informed and responsive? It means taking the time to listen to our students' stories and learn about their struggles. We can't simply expect our students to initiate this conversation. We must be active participants by being curious and taking a genuine interest in learning more about these amazing human beings. Learning their stories after the fact is too late, leaving us wonder, wondering what we could have done differently to help. Students living with ACEs sometimes become very good at not feeling, because too often, experiencing emotion leads to disappointment. What helped that student move forward from a feeling of hopelessness to one of hope? Simply giving them information is unlikely to cause change. On the other hand, when we connect in relationships at the level of feelings and emotion, meaningful change happens. Relational health is the single best predictor of positive outcomes. This means we must be willing to be vulnerable as well and experience emotions with them. We must offer unconditional love and non-judgmental support. This isn't easy. It takes time. It takes patience. One must have faith in the process. This process can't be measured with traditional data, but it is the single most important thing that we do. The way a student who has experienced trauma values school is based on how the adults in that school value him or her. If the adults only value that student based on his or her grades, GPA, test scores, and other measurable quantitative data, that student won't find much value in school. On the other hand, if the adults in school find value in that student as an individual with their own story to tell, find value in establishing a positive relationship, no matter how difficult that is to do, and offer unconditional love and non-judgmental support, that student will find value in those relationships and school that will last a lifetime. By including trauma-informed school incentive aid, we can fund these relationships and programs. We can fund more social workers and counselors. We can begin to give the professional development that so many educators across the state are craving. I've done trainings in trauma across the country and all across the state from Sabika to Wasika. School district leaders from across the state wanting to learn more come to visit our program in Stewartville all the time. The need is there. The need is real. This money will make a difference. Every child deserves unconditional love and non-judgmental support, no matter their grades, behavior, family history, or life struggles. I am blessed to work with such an amazing group of young human beings. They're all great kids. Some just don't know it yet. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Perry, how many schools in Minnesota have REACH programs? Do you know? Uh, Mr. Perry? There, when we first started, there were only four or five. Right now, there are almost 40 across the state with the common goal of providing a safe place for students and to provide them a wide variety of supports that they may be needing. 
Representative Rudolph. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Perry, um, I, I have a, a REACH program in my district. Uh, Hutchinson has yes, a sir. program. And, uh, interestingly, with Representative uh, Lislegard, who is far north of us, uh, we had a, a session uh, earlier this year in uh, in Hutchinson with the REACH program with the students and the teachers and uh, I found it uh, very valuable and I, I think uh, you were doing very important <coughs> work and actually uh, <clears throat> a couple of days ago when I mentioned to Commissioner Ricker coming to Hutchinson and, and becoming aware of a couple of programs uh, this is one of them. Thank you sir. Um, Chad Harlander and I from Hutchinson will be traveling again to Dallas in July to work with more than 200 at-risk youth there ACEs are everywhere. This isn't just big town, small t town. It's not rich versus poor. ACEs are everywhere. Um, I grew up in a, in a home where there was trauma. They are everywhere. I understand that. Um, and we need to be able to provide that support to any child who needs that unconditionally. Senator Nelson. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Perry. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for being here. Um, I've seen what you do. It's remarkable. And you were a leader in this area. Um, I was trained in ACES by Dr. Anda, uh, who uh, was one of the founders of how important these adverse childhood experiences are and how much they impact children and adults. Uh, and so uh, I'm highly supportive of this. Um, I just um, have uh, one question, and I don't know that it would be for you. I think it would be for uh, Ms. Hofer, uh, because I do believe that uh, I, I think it is very critical, and, and again, I've seen what you've done. My question is a, to a broader scale. Um, you know, I can see that we would want all of our teachers uh, trained in ACEs because, as you said, it's everywhere. Uh, there are students who are um, impacted more so than others, but once you get to three or four of those ACEs, uh, these things are going to um, severely impact uh, our, our child's ability to uh, do well in school and life. And so it's very important that we uh, have educators who are aware of ACEs and understand and have ways of, uh, much as you have in Stewartville, um, helping these children move through that, that trauma. Uh, and so my question is to the higher scale, um, how much do we, how much, do we have the numbers on how much uh, staff development our schools must uh, spend. I know that I believe 2% of their budgets need to be set aside for staff development. And I'm just wondering if we could get some sort of a num what is that number? So how much of our staff development, how much staff development dollars do our schools have? And where, while they're looking that up, Mr. Mm -hmm, Chair, mm -hmm. you might know where I'm going with this. I think uh, and a different approach might be to make sure that ACES is part of staff development. So we have a significant amount of money that our schools must set aside for staff development. And it just seems to me that we know how important uh, ACES are. Here it's called trauma-informed uh, support programs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not much of a one, typically, for any type of Band-Aid. But I, can, I cannot imagine um, an educator who would not be better prepared if they did not have ACES training. In other words, I, it's a universal that all of our educators, I think, uh, are in need of ACES training. Uh, and um, so I'm just curious, what amount of money are we talking about that our school districts have for uh, staff development? Do we have so, access to that? So Madam Chair, I, I don't think it's a matter of either or as you're presenting it. I think it's a yes and. If you look at the, the proposal for trauma-informed schools, uh, it's targeted aid towards 20 schools that are amongst the 40 schools that have been identified as having the largest uh, differential in discipline between students of color and white students in the state. And these uh, are then schools that we're targeting to uh, pilot some of these interventions deepen the state's collective understanding of how best to do this, what works. They, they would need to collaborate. What's working, what's not working, how are you doing it differently in your building than I am in mine, uh, so that they can uh, share best practices 
and then we can we can learn and lift it up more broadly. So it's it's not an either or. I suggest it's a yes and. If we fail to target where we know the greatest need is, we fail, I think, then to grab the the opportunity to best meet the needs of those students in those 20 buildings. Uh, who's who's best prepared to answer the center's question? Uh, <coughs> ah, Mr. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm sure that Mr. Strom also has it at the ready. But um, as you know, staff development, staff development reserve equals 2% of the, at least 2% of the school district basic revenue mm -hmm. uh, per year. So for fiscal 20, that would be approximately $121 million reserved. All right. Thank you. So, Mr. Chair. Yep. And thank you so much. So my concern mm -hmm. is uh, Stewartville would not have been oh. one of those targeted, mm -hmm. targeted schools. And so it's just something that I think we need to consider uh, as we move forward, and as far as um, not either or, but and too, a lot of what we do in our education budget will, will be determined by um, when we get that joint budget target, how, m how much revenue is going to be raised or how many taxes are going to be raised to fund the program. Mm -hmm. So I think um, I just see this as essential and um, in, in very interested in encouraging uh, staff development dollars mm -hmm. Uh, for ACES and I would like to ask so Mr. Perry, how did you you were a pioneer as far as the reach program How I wasn't, did you I wasn't the first um, my Mr. focus Perry. Thank you, sir. Um, I was not the first I really was following the Hutchinson program lead, uh, but my Focus on adverse childhood experiences was really new for reach um, So that was really pioneering as far as the reach programs across mm -hmm. the state I'd like to add in addition to the fact that ACEs are everywhere. I've given the questionnaire that I'm referencing here to hundreds of students. They are everywhere. This is not big school versus small school or wealth versus poverty at all. ACEs are everywhere. In addition to staff development, because every teacher should be trained. I agree 100% with that. Mm -hmm. But I also would state that there have to be human resources dedicated in, in the trenches to deal with the situations and daily issues that come up with these students. It's not a temporary band-aid that we're just gonna fix something that happened last night. When I think of my students, I think 10 years down the road. It is the generational trauma that they have experienced going to be passed on down one more generation. That doesn't just mean teacher training. That's a huge part of it, but it also means bodies in the trenches working with these students to move past barriers and setbacks and to give them the tools that they need in order to be the best community members, the best church members, the best employees, the best parents that they can possibly be. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Senator Nelson. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Perry. So the bill in front of us just calls for professional development, which is that staff development. So um, you've been so successful in the Stewartville school system, and it's a small school system, um, not one of our most highly funded on an average per pupil basis uh, schools. So how, how is Stewartville making this work? How are you, and I think I might have seen something on Facebook which might lead me to think there might be a, yeah, a fiscal um, challenge here, but tell me how, the, how Stewartville made this work. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Perry. Yes, sir. Um, programs don't change people. People do. Having the right people in place that understand the struggles and are willing to be vulnerable and um, non-judgmental and offer that unconditional support. It is people that change people. Um, that's, that's a huge part of it. There are multiple REACH programs across the state. Um, there are multiple other programs across the state. Those that struggle the most are staffed by those that don't necessarily understand the true issue that they're trying to fix. It's not if this happened to you, this is our response. It is a long-term, very long-term response to helping kids become better people. Um, for me, I have a, a young lady in the ninth grade who was at 0% through semester time across the board, every single class. She did not love herself. She did not like herself. She did not like the world. And through REACH, we were able to teach her to love herself, and through loving herself, she was able to give more of her time and attention to her academics and to other areas <coughs> of her life, and she is set and ready to graduate in three weeks. 
Um, Fantastic. <clears throat> Mr. Senator. So, uh, so uh, Mr. Perry, I just uh, salute you. Uh, you've done a remarkable job. Uh, the teachers uh, in Stewartville are so thankful uh, for what you are doing, and you're changing lives. And so you, um, I, I thank you for coming and sharing this today. Thank you. Uh, Representative Sandstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Perry. I think what you're doing is phenomenal. I also want to share with people around our table, as we're talking about all the programs that are being offered and staff development monies, we have already spent, just on what we heard yesterday and today, if those provisions were to go in, more than the 2% set aside. So teachers um, or districts receive 2% of their budget, and it's supposed to be set aside for staff development. I want people to be aware of all of the provisions that uh, we are expected or districts are expected to provide through that. You know, we have the suicide training, we have dyslexia training we're providing or talking about. We have uh, now if we take this on under staff development, that staff development money is long spent. And a whole nother conversation is that Oftentimes, you need to be aware, districts already go to their staff and ask them to please give up your 2% in exchange for keeping a staff member, for having another classroom teacher or programming money. So we cannot and should not rely on staff development money to cover all of this. All right. Thank you, Representative Stanseed. Mr. P uh, Senator Weaker. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I thank each of the testifiers and also um, for Principal Peters. Uh, Richardson School is in North St. Paul. That's where I went to school as well as Representative Lilly. And you're doing a remarkable job. Uh, as we had in the letter from the many teachers of the year, trauma is at the core, the core of the opportunity gap. And your points about unconditional love for these kiddos. And then it reminds me of the very moving a movie that we saw mm. about love them first yes. about Lucy Laney uh, this is very important and it's going to make a difference thanks for your testimony thank you Senator Weaver <laughs> Ms. Peters Mr. Perry thank you very much for your time Mr. Peters or Mr. Perry congratulations on your award thank you thank, thank you. you very much uh, Ms. Hernandez You brought friends. I brought friends. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, you were a uh, champion in 2017, I believe it was, of, of some targeted work on increasing the percentage of teachers of color in the state. Uh, we have uh, wanted to pick up and enhance that work. Uh, my personal belief, uh, one of my bywords for, for this session certainly, uh, is uh, intentional, that we can kind of throw the net wide and get whatever fish we want trying to work a little weekend analogy here, folks. Um, or, or, or we can go out and, and troll in where the waters are good uh, for the, the species we're looking for. Um, we can throw the net wide in teacher preparation and, and recruitment and get probably about what we're getting now. Or we can do some targeted and intentional work in increasing the percentages of teachers of color in our classrooms uh, so that they better reflect the students in the classrooms. With that, Ms. Hernandez, I'll, I'll let you kick it off. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Is this on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just checking. Just checking. I think, we, I, yeah, I think you've got the voice regardless. Very good. <laughs> Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, my name is Violeta Hernandez Espinosa, and I'm Education Legislative Director for the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs. My comments today are also representing the views of the Minnesota, uh, Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans, and the Council for Minnesotans of African Heritage. Uh, I am joined today by my colleague, Katie Sly, from the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans, and also in the audience, my colleague, Anjuli Mishra, from the same council. Um, I believe Patrice from the Council on uh, Minnesotans of African Heritage was to be here and was unable to make it as well. Um, Ma uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, 
As state agencies, we have the important statutory duty to advise and inform elected officials about our constituent communities and their needs. Our four constituent communities have many concerns, needs, and assets. So it's very important to note that the top priority in education that has united our four councils in an unprecedented way over the past three sessions has been the need to increase teachers of color and American Indian teachers, or TOKAIT for short. For the record, and to supplement my comments today, please see our four councils joint statement in your packets. While Minnesota's K-12 population has grown from 24% to 34% students of, who are of color and indigenous over the past decade, we remain at only 4% teachers of color in the state, and we continue to have the nation's worst achievement gaps for students of color. One significant reason why our achievement gaps remain so wide is that our state still has not addressed the severe shortage of TOKAI on a systems level rather than a small program level. This gap will only keep widening with significant educational and social costs if we don't start taking more bold actions to address them. Research is clear that teachers of color help, help narrow achievement gaps and positively impact all students. Thankfully, in the 2016 session, several statutes were amended promising that all students should have equitable access to effective and diverse teachers who reflect the diversity of their schools. Then, in 2017, Senator Nelson and Representative Erdahl championed the first ever Increased Teachers of Color Act as its lead authors. Because the House did not hear the bill, Senator Nelson exemplified bold leadership by carrying most of the provisions of that bill across the finish line. Then, the 2018 Increased Teachers of Color Act was authored by Republicans in both House by John Kosnick and Senate uh, by Paul Anderson. Combining the language in the 2017 and 2018 acts was how the first draft of this year's act was created 11 months ago. So we are very grateful that the important comprehensive policy provisions and significant appropriation increases in the House omnibus bill adopted under the leadership of Chair Joachim and Chair Dabney retains and builds upon the bipartisan work of the past three sessions. This year's comprehensive Increased Teachers of Color Act was carefully crafted over several months based on extensive input from stakeholders, from our constituent communities, from key educational organizations, and from three administering state agencies. It gained significant bipartisan support, co-authorship in both the Senate and House, as you can see on the cover page of the handout Paul is holding up of the comparison document, uh, a comparison document, and received moving testimony from students, teachers, and teacher candidates of color in house hearings. This year's act also earned the endorsement of 50 organizations, including our four state councils. As you can see listed on the last page of that document. I'd like to pause for a, for a few moments for you to skim this list. Please note how very different groups based on role in education, policy positions, religion, geography, and ethnicity have united to support this bill. The 2019 Increased Teachers of Color Act proposed 80 million appropriation and investments over the biennium is the minimum needed to start increasing the percentage of TOKAI each year. And the House was able to propose 29 million from education and 8.4 million from higher education committees. Regardless of the size of the target, this conference committee receives and the finance decisions you make, there is very important policy from our com comprehensive bill adopted by the House that will do much more to strengthen existing programs 
and establishing new programs with more accountability and more focus on ensuring that precious state dollars are addressing the severe shortage of tokai. These policies alone will significantly increase the return on investment to serve all students. However, they need to be matched by significantly more investments beyond the current base for established, established programs if we are serious about increasing the percentage of tokai. In sum, we implore both chairs of this committee, all committee members, and the commissioner to continue your bipartisan leadership and make decisions that will increase the percentage of tokai in Minnesota. By demonstrating this leadership in the coming days, you will make history in the state and country and do much to improve our students' equitable access to effective teachers, effective and diverse teachers. Thank you and please use us as a resource in the days, as, days ahead as you deliberate on final decisions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Spies, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, members, my name is Paul Spies. I'm with the Coalition to Increase Teachers of Color and American Indian Teachers in Minnesota. We were honored to have Mr. Chair and Madam Chair attend the third annual or third birthday party for the coalition in December before either of you were named as chairs of your committees. And you saw a wonderful gathering of people and you heard their stories about how important this work was and we really appreciated you attending that. The coalition just formed three and a half years ago with 40 people who said we have to unite across institutions and districts throughout the state and organizations and now we have over 1,300 people. So we appreciate the strong partnership with the councils. And we're here because we have sought unity and consensus on the measures that you have in the, in the omnibus bill that you're seeing. This is important work that has been done and advocated for by many people. So we look at this as like a baby omnibus bill within your omnibus bill. If you, if you can think of it that way, right? There's many sections to it. And, and one of the problems that we've done as a state over the last two decades is that we've funded relatively few and relatively small programs. But we haven't yet taken a systemic approach to address this, this severe shortage of teachers of color and American Indian teachers. So we have to do that. And I'd like to just briefly run through this handout that lays out what is in this mini omnibus bill within your omnibus bills to look at. So Dr. Spies, I would ask briefly. We will do that. All right. If you look at page three, the increased teacher of color in American Indian Teacher Minnesota Goal and Report, the bottom of page three, this would for the first time establish a state goal and accountability reporting to bring all of the state money that has, is being appropriated in various programs together in, a, in one comprehensive report so you as decision makers can see the accountability that's happening. Right now, as you know, individual grant programs come forward and we don't have this type of accountability. The next page, four, the expanded Grow Your Own program is very important because what we have here is a very popular program that's more than eight times larger in terms of the number of grantees received since 2017 when it was expanded, but the funding hasn't expanded. So we need more money to have in two different programs to ensure that these popular Grow Your Own programs, not just the few that are established now, are in statute and not just session law. The Collaborative Urban and Greater Minnesota Educator of Color program is also one that is expanded on page five in this omnibus bill through the house. And it's very important because we have 31 teacher preparation programs in the state. The original <laughs> Q institutions were only four. Now this is expanded and we need more appropriations for this fully competitive grant program to be established in the state. Moving to page Six, the American Indian Teacher Prep Programs. This also expands the competitive grants 
beyond the four institutions and collaborative programs that exist with some extra appropriation. One thing that's very new this year on page seven is an expansion of the types of ways that state money, current state money can be spent for teacher mentorship and if retaining effective teachers. One of the things we've focused on in the past has been getting more teachers of color into the profession, but not on retaining them. And so we need to have that return on investment protected with the provisions in the teacher mentorship section with some grant money to support that as well. On page eight, another thing that drives out teachers of color from the profession is <laughs> school climates and curriculum that are not inclusive or respectful of all, uh, of all teachers of color or of all students of color and all families of color. And so what we need to do is pass these policy provisions for the Achievement and Integration Program and the World's Best Workforce Plans to ensure that they create climate and curriculum in our schools that are inclusive and respectful of all members. We have inclusive school enhancement grants on page nine, come teach in Minnesota bonuses and retention bonuses, hiring and retention bonuses, because we won't reach our goal of moving the needle from four to five percent unless we import teachers in the state. Page 10 looks at the comparison between the intro to teaching courses and the teacher shortage loan forgiveness program, important policy matters that are needing to be passed. And then the exams required for licensure on page 11, make sure that teachers have already proven that they're effective and skilled. They've taught for at least three years. They can, they can qualify for a tier four license except they're struggling to pass those skills exams. Thank you so much for your support. We need your continued support to get this across the finish line. Thank you. Dr. Spies, Ms. Ms. Slide, did I get that right? Do you have uh, brief comments? To, uh, do you have anything to add? Uh, uh, no, I don't have any comments to add. Uh, Violetta spoke on behalf okay. of the council. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Questions from members? Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, the, the Senate has requested a lunch break. Uh, so we will uh, stand in recess to the call of chair until approximately 2 o'clock.